Hello, Iterative Marketers. Welcome to the Iterative Marketing Podcast, where each week we give marketers and entrepreneurs actionable ideas, techniques, and examples to improve your marketing results. If you want notes and links to the resources discussed on the show, sign up to get them emailed to you each week at iterativemarketing.net. There you'll also find the Iterative Marketing blog and our community LinkedIn group where you can share ideas and ask questions of your fellow Iterative Marketers. Now let's dive into the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Iterative Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Robinson, and with me, as always, is the smart and imaginative Elizabeth Aaron. How are you doing today, Elizabeth? I'm good, Steve. How are you? Well, as you can tell by the sound of my voice, I am getting over a cold that uh, made me lose my voice earlier in the week. Yeah, I'm not doing much better myself. I've uh, I've got the onsets of a cold uh, coming as well. I thought we were supposed to be out of cold and flu season here. I think that when you have toddlers and small children, there's it's it's a year-round thing. It doesn't quite go away. Yeah, they are um, they are really efficient at the whole like finding germs, incubating them, and distributing them. Oh yes, definitely. And they're done as disguised as as sweet, lovely kisses. I think and snuggles and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about experiments. Excellent. We're really going to get into how experiments fit into iterative marketing because we've talked about experiments in the past, right? We have. We have. We've done a couple of episodes and, and we'll refer to those uh, throughout the episode and, and refer to them in the show links, uh, the show notes as well. Um, I think it's important that we say that when we talk about experiments, we're talking about experiments within the context of, of, of iterative marketing, which may be a little different from how most marketers approach what they would consider experiments or A-B tests or split tests. So we'll get into to why that's a little bit different. And then we're going to uh, follow up with how to use experiments to generate actionable insights, which is also um, kind of a, a component of iterative marketing. And then finally, we'll give you some, some tips and tricks on how to make sure that you are getting the most out of experiments at your organization. So let's start off with what, what we mean when we say experiments. So experiments are usually comparing the status quo against a new idea, either Um, either a new idea or a new way of delivering that idea, Um, sort of any sort of change that you're making to what you're currently running. And the idea is that you're going to pit the old idea or your control or version A against the new idea or your version B or your variable. And in doing so, you're going to execute what's called a split test or an A-B test in order to find out which one is the, the better idea or the better delivery mechanism for getting your idea to your audience. And a lot of marketers are doing this. Um, They are running their own split tests or A-B tests um, today. The difference, though, is when we start talking about these tests as it relates to iterative marketing. And so what what makes it different? Well, we have a little bit more finite definition of what an experiment is above and beyond an A-B test. And it really has to qualify under two additional parameters. And one of those is, uh, is it scientific? Are we using uh, scientific methods? Um, it, do you have a control? Do you have a variable? Are you using statistical significance um, uh, and statistical calculations in order to determine your result? And the other is, um, are you generating more than just a bump in, a lift in conversion rates or, or revenue? Are you going after insights as well? Do you have a hypothesis before you start your test? So let's jump back to scientific real fast. I want to I want to dig into that because um, as anyone who's listened to the podcast before kind of knows that um, the scientific piece, the data piece is not something that comes natural to me yet. I see the importance of it. And so I want to make sure our listeners who are in the same boat as me understand that um, this isn't scary and it is doable. And we actually have a really great episode about that. Episode 22, Let's Talk st- Statistics. Um, that is a really great reference point and I highly recommend listening to um, because it helps to put this into um, into perspective and help you really gain an understanding of what it is so that you can apply this and make sure that you do have statistically significant results. Yeah, you don't need a lab coat. You don't need a degree in engineering or mathematics. It's it's not rocket science here, but it is adhering to some some pretty sound principles to make sure that the results that you're generating are the results that you mean to generate. And that's important when we get into the second sort of difference here with iterative marketing and, and experimentation, and, and that's the insights. Um, because if we're going to you know, go to our organization and say, this is what we've learned, we want to be confident that what we're saying is true. Exactly, exactly. 
And again, we talk about that more in episode seven, where we talk about a designing effective an effective experiment and going after those insights and not just, you know, which button color is better or which home page is better home page works better. Mm-hmm. And again, the the point here when we talk about these insights, and this is one of the things that I love about iterative marketing and I feel kind of sets it apart and this really comes through in experimentation is that um, you know we're not just throwing those two different ideas up there we're, we're testing for a specific hypothesis we're testing to find out um, you know which one performs better and it goes beyond um, to your point button color it's something that can extend across the organization and so um, you know this kind of gets into uh, other topics that we've talked about before but really helping to increase the value of marketing across the organization as a whole. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the podcast when we get into how to make sure that the experiments that you are running um, are delivering the most value to you and your organization. Um, Should we jump into what the role of experiments are within iterative marketing? Yeah, I think I think that's a, a great place to go next. And um, you know, there there's two separate roles um, when we talk about experiments within uh, iterative marketing and 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 the process. And uh, the first of that is is testing a tactic in a small way before going big. And that really ties into our um, fundamental truth of, of, of starting small. Um, and then the second one is continuous improvement for running your programs. And I think we probably want to dive into, into both of those. So why don't we start with starting small? Sure. So um, before you go to start a new program or a new strategy or tactic within an existing program, you probably don't want to throw a ton of money at something until you have some indicators that that you're going to find some success there. And so you can execute a well-controlled experiment to compare the new idea of how you might bring an idea to life or take it to market compared to what you've been doing to date. Uh, You just need to make sure that your control, what you've been doing to date and your variable have the same objective, and then you can can go to town testing something. Alternatively, you can still run an experiment uh, without necessarily having a control just to determine if, if, if something is going to be effective based on an objective or a goal or a baseline of what you need to hit in order to, to determine success. Do you have an example that maybe you could share with the audience? Sure. So um, let's say you have an, an existing program and you sell pro, uh, poker sets, for example. And your existing program discounts uh, the price by 15% um, using a coupon code to see if you can't get uh, um, uh, more immediate business and, and, and get people across the, the, the finish line here to buy. And you have an idea, well, what if instead of discounting our price, we added more value and maybe we gave away a free deck of premium cards along with every order? Um, how does that compare to the discount in price? So you could set up a, a very simple experiment running just um, uh, a limited amount of Facebook creative uh, and compare the response rate and the conversion rate of that small test against the um, existing program to see if going the route of adding value or going the route of uh, including an added bonus is as effective or more effective than a discount in price. And again, you're not talking about, you know, launching this out as, as part of the overall strategy. We're talking about starting with a really small audience. So, you know, we're, we're just looking at, at Facebook. And so a very targeted, small and concise, a, a small part of the budget. But the insights that we gain from this experiment can, then can be applied across the program going forward, right? Right. You can take that same insight that you learned there, and now you can apply that to your display advertising and your print advertising and and even fundamentally to how you approach uh, servicing your clients. If you understand that your customers really value, um, uh, w- would really appreciate more value versus a discount in price, that could be a fundamental shift in your entire go-to-market strategy if you start to apply and test that elsewhere. Yeah, we actually um, had this exact scenario with with a client. We had a technology client who wanted to know, they were ready to expand and wanted to know what the right market was to go into. And they were considering biosciences, healthcare and manufacturing. And so we set up a very simple Facebook program for each of these three audiences, very minimal spend. Um, and, and, and based on that, we were able to help them determine that manufacturing was actually their best option. Exactly. The key is start small, figure out what the minimally viable test you can run is that's going to have statistically significant results. And we, you know, in the, in episodes, uh, the episode we talked about uh, 
um, statistics. Uh, we, we refer to a couple of tools, the, um, uh, your uh, confidence calculator and your sample size calculator. So you want to use those to make sure that your, your test isn't too small and then uh, uh, execute it to see if you can get better results than you're getting with your existing marketing activities. If it works, go big. Yeah, exactly. And it's great because if you start small, you actually have the ability to, um, if your audience size is big enough, actually test more than one thing. So in this particular scenario with our client, we were able to explore multiple opportunities at once, um, which you know shortened the length of time before we were able to recommend and, and the client was able to make a decision. Um, and so you know that's one of those things to, that, that you can consider as well if you're able to set that up and you have the audience size that um, you know, starting small allows us to explore more than one opportunity and decide which of those options makes the most sense for our business. Yep. So that's the starting small component. What does it look like from a continuous improvement standpoint? So continuous improvement um, really you know, gets down to the heart of iterative marketing. Um, but the experimentation allows us to continuously optimize on our existing programs, which leads to that continuous improvement that we strive for. So, for example, if you already had a program running and it was successful on Facebook, but you wanted to make it better, um, you might take a look at, okay, how are we targeting our audience on Facebook? And maybe there's a couple of different targeting mechanisms between, you know, um, uh, their interests versus some of their demographics or maybe a behavioral targeting. And you could split off a, a separate segment and test targeting that segment differently using, say, behavioral versus uh, uh, interest-based targeting and run those both concurrently and see which one produced better results. Yeah, and keeping all things equal, you're using the same creative. So really, we're just looking at those different audiences um, and setting the test up that way. We've actually done this with a client. Um, we have an industrial client that was targeting a, a, a very specific audience, very specific. Um, and that audience was available through third-party data, but we weren't sure how, how viable those lists were because this was such a specific audience. Um, and so we're... we're we looped through the looped through those different audiences that were available to us and tested until we figured out what the right audience was for that specific program. The key is that you're keeping things the same as far as everything else goes. So you're keeping the same creative, um, you're still targeting the same audience with the same objective, and all you're doing is, you know, uh, splitting your targeting mechanisms to see which one performs better. Yeah, and with with the example of our of our industrial client, that program had been up and running for months. It was very successful, but just because it was doing well doesn't mean it can't do better. And so that's what we were looking for, that opportunity. And so we looked for that opportunity to improve on their current results, which is that continuous improvement that we strive for. And because, um, you know, how this was set up and, and what, what it was we were testing, this could actually run the same time that we had other experiments running. So we had insights coming in left and right. And, and it's fantastic because then we have the ability to apply that and again, build on that continuous improvement. So I think that's a great lead into kind of overall covering why we run these experiments. Why not run iterative marketing without experiments? Experimentation's important. And, you know, I don't, I, maybe you can enlighten me, but I don't see how you can do iterative marketing without experimentation. No, I think it's really core at the iteration part of it. Otherwise, you're just randomly shooting in the dark and simply replacing things to replace them, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, experimentation lets you do that in an educated way. And you've said this before, um, you know, if you're not experimenting all the time, then then you're wrong. And that sounds that sounds so severe. But can you go into kind of the thought process behind that and why not experimenting means you're wrong? Well, if the rest of the world stood still, you'd be fine. Um, but that's not a reality, at least not for most of us. Uh, what you have is there's constantly changing forces uh, externally to your own marketing program. So there's changes in market dynamics. You have new competitors coming in and coming out of the uh, uh, the same space that you're operating in. There's changes in, in consumer preference or in uh, features and benefits. And so if you're not consistently iterating and testing and experimenting, you're running the same thing. And the same thing will eventually stop working because something is going to change around you to, to break it. And by experimenting, you are at least keeping pace, if not consistently improving upon past successes. I think there's also a, a, a loss portion to this, and that's if you're not focused on experimentation, then there's that um, sort of wasted 
there's that opportunity cost um, of wasted gains of not testing. Um, you know, we've got a, a small window to be able to test on, and each test builds on top of each other. And so if we have a period of time where we're not testing, then we've lost that opportunity opportunity to get that time back. But not only that, we've lost that opportunity to build on whatever insight, insights came from that experimentation. Um, and so, you know, not experimenting actually puts you behind the game. If you could produce leads at at eighty dollars a lead, but you are producing leads at a hundred dollars a lead, I mean that's a twenty dollar per lead loss that you're not able to you know effectively realize because you're not running the experiments to identify them. The other place where you have the opportunity cost is in launching new initiatives and new programs. You now have to wager with a bigger bet when you go and launch something because you didn't test it first. And so by executing effective experiments on the front end, you're able to uh, minimize your risk and, 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 and maximize your return on new programs, new initiatives, new ideas, new creative, new targeting methods, all of them. One other thing that I, I really like about experimentation, and I think we've all probably been in this scenario before, um, but experiment sort of, it, it takes the opinion out of the question. Um, and we've all been in that scenario where we're looking at creative and someone's like, well, I don't like it. And they it's their own personal opinion, but now that creative may be off the table or you've got to work even harder to try and get it to move forward because someone didn't like it and they don't necessarily have a reason for why they didn't like it um, and so experimentation helps to take that emotion out of those group decisions because rather than you know saying that someone doesn't like it you now have proof saying well even if you don't agree with that our audience loves it it resonates we've got a higher conversion rate we've got a higher click-through rate um, and you can't argue with that or you it's harder to argue with that no the best is when somebody comes in and says that creative isn't going to work because i know that our audience hates purple, for example. I mean, that's an extreme. But um, now you can say, well, you know, can we test that assumption? Because I'm not sure that our audience hates purple. And I would really love to find out and document this in a, in a scientific way. Hardly anybody will say no, first of all, because if they really think they're right, then you're giving them the opportunity to prove they're right. Um, and you end up now with a, a great insight and you're able to test the assumptions that the organization has been operating under in countless other areas. Mm -hmm. I think the other key thing that um, experimentation gives us is if it's used correctly, it really helps us um, make failure okay. You know, we as marketers can't be perfect. We never have enough data. We don't really know when things are shifting out there in the marketplace real time. And uh, by setting up the expectations of those around us and above us that we are running an experiment and we don't know what the outcome is going to be, then success is, is insight, it's knowledge, it's finding out the best path forward, it's not whether or not the creative that we launched worked. And so by operating under experiments, it actually makes us a lot more comfortable as marketers because we're able to set the expectation at um, we're going to learn and then we're going to apply what we learn to make money, not just we're going to make money. And, you know, I like this because I think so often marketers are asked to be fortune tellers. Well, is this creative going to work? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think so. I wouldn't have presented the idea if I didn't think it was going to work. But now you have this this extra level of fear of, oh, gosh, it better work or, or they're not going to trust me next time I, I want to pitch an idea. And this takes that out of it. It gives us the power to say, you know, I'm not sure, but this is my reasoning for why I think it's going to work. Let's test it. Let's see. Um, and it, it kind of opens you up and increases that value within the organization because you become someone who is using the data and who is uh, making sure that the decisions that we're making going forward are very well thought out and we've got a plan for them. Well, I think this is a great point for us to take a quick break and uh, go help some people. Before we continue, I'd like to take a quick moment to ask you iterative marketers a small but meaningful favor and ask that you give back to your community. Usually, we ask that you make a donation to a charity or a cause submitted by one of our listeners. However, this week, we're doing something a little different. With the start of the school year right around the corner, we're asking that our listeners donate to their local schools. Many schools have students that cannot afford basic school supplies, and we kindly ask that you contact your local district and find out how you can help ensure that something as simple as a pencil or paper will not be the barrier to a child's academic success. Next week, we will return to highlighting causes submitted by our listeners. If you would like to submit a cause for consideration for our next podcast, please visit iterativemarketing.net slash podcast and click the share a cause button. We love sharing causes that are important to you. 
And we're back. So before the break, we defined what an experiment is. We um, talked through how experiments fit within iterative marketing and why they're so important. Um, I think now let's talk a little bit about the uh, logistically of how you execute them within iterative marketing. Um, uh, one of the questions I know that we get on a regular basis is, how many experiments should I be running right now? And that really depends on on three things, and I know that doesn't make this an easy answer, um, but it's it's resources, audience size, and how many opportunities you have to experiment. Yeah, so we all have limited resources, and the fact of the matter is that ex experiments aren't free. Um, they do take resources. They take resources in setting up the experiment, administering it, and measuring it, and watching it. Okay, so you have to have that that resource, whether it's internal or external, working on that. You also have oftentimes um, when you're running an experiment, if it's re regarding creative or some digital experience, you're going to have to create two versions of either the creative or the digital experience, which means paying for additional creative or, or, or development costs. And then finally, sometimes we need to throw a few extra dollars at media at something just to get the audience size where it needs to be to execute an experiment. And we've seen that situation occur here or there. Um, so at some point, if you try to run experiments everywhere, a lot of organizations will simply run out of resources for their current budget. Um, the good news is if you're consistently generating insights and those insights are improving your return on investment and uh, helping prove your value to those that are, you know, have the purse strings, that that budget generally will go up over time and you'll be able to execute more experiments. Um, but in the meantime, you know, budgets are what they are. So that's looking at it from a resource perspective. Taking a look at it from an audience size perspective, our audience size limits the number of experiments that we're able to run. And this comes back to um, you know some of the resources that we referred to in our Talking About st Statistics podcast. Um, but to get statistically significant results, you need to have a large enough audience. Um, and the tool we referenced in episode 22, the sample size calculator and the statistical significance calculator will help you to, deter to determine what that is. Um, but again, not every audience is big enough to use to use in, to do an experiment on and an example of this is we had a manufacturer that we're working with um, that has a, a key persona um, that when we take a look at their audience size, it's very, very limited. There's about 100 people in it. And so that is not large enough to run any experimentation on it at all or any experimentation that's going to result in statistically significant results that we feel comfortable going back to the client and saying, yes, we know that this is something that is repeatable. This is something that we can reproduce in the future and we should make decisions based on this data. Yeah, and the last area where you're going to find that you hit a wall in, in how many experiments you can run concurrently is how many, you know, what we call experiment slots. And, and what do I mean by slot? Well, um, a slot is, you know, for every audience that you have, you have a, a limited number of positions in their, their, their customer journey where you can run an experiment because you can really only one, run one experiment at a time for every um every intersection of, a, of an audience in creative or every intersection of an audience in a targeting mechanism. So for example, if you wanted to test two creatives with a, against a particular direct response program um, for a particular audience, that slot is now filled and you cannot test any other creatives when you're looking at marketing to that particular audience. Um, the same thing is true on the, 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 the targeting side where, you know, say, for example, you're running some Twitter advertising and you think that you can uh, target that Twitter advertising in a better way and you want to test it and run an experiment. Well, now you've kind of occupied your, your Twitter targeting slot with this experiment. And until this experiment runs its course, um, you're not going to be able to introduce any other testing inside of that that's regarding targeting on Twitter. At some point, um, you know, we've got experiments running everywhere that we have a large enough audience. And that's sort of the the perfect world that we're getting to. Because again, you only have so much time and uh, available to run these. And so when you're able to really maximize those spots based on your audience, then you can maximize those insights. So the last thing I want to make sure that we talk about today is really getting the value out of your experiments that you're running. Um, I think at this point, we probably sold you on experiments. If not, then we didn't do our jobs. Um, go back and start over and listen again, and we'll see if it works a second time. Um, uh, let's talk about um, 
if you're running experiments, how do you extract the most value from the resources that you did have to dedicate to them? And I, I sort of uh, just mentioned this right before we moved into this point, but we really want to run as many experiments as our resources, our audience, and our programs allow for. Because again, each experiment that we run is going to build off of each other. So if we're able to very strategically plan these out um, so that we constantly have experiments running, we're constantly building on what we learned, then we can maximize our results. The, the next thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that we keep a ledger of those insights, those results that we are generating. Because if you learn something and then you know, don't do anything with it or don't even write it down, then you have no chance of, of improving on it. And what you'll find is that, particularly if you're keeping this ledger in the context of your, your audience segments as you've defined them, so say by persona, now you can loop through, okay, what do we know about Kathy? Okay, Kathy does like this and doesn't like this, and uh, um, uh, we want to avoid trying to target Kathy this way because it just doesn't work. And then all of a sudden you're reading through that and you realize, whoa, there's several ideas or gaps here in our knowledge that this would make a great experiment or that would make a great experiment. Um, it could also come up with great ideas for future content or creative or, or future uh, entire programs for, for a given audience segment. One thing you said, it's, it's important to keep uh you know, a log of those insights, but it's important to apply those insights as well. Um, and, it, you know, if we're running the experiments and we're writing them down, we want to make sure that those are, are, are being applied. Um, and so it's not just about killing what's not performing. Um, it's also seeing where those insights can be applied. And to your point, it can be applied to um, updating the personas. It can be um, lead to uh, future ideation for upcoming experiments. It can lead to program expansions. You know, in the in the example we gave of our client who wanted to go into a new market, we were able to determine that this was the market that they were going into, which opened up an entirely new program for them, an entirely new audience. And so those are, um, you know, some of, the, again, making sure that you're making the most out of your experimentation is applying those insights. And then finally, you want to make sure that you're reporting what you learn. And so, um, this is not just reporting it up the ladder to your boss or, or to the CMO or to the CEO. This is also reporting it um, laterally throughout the organization because every little bit that you learn about the consumer of your product or service can help others within the organization, probably in ways that you can't even think of. And so get the results out there. And I think that's a great point in ways you can't think of. You understand marketing um, so well, uh, but the people that run other departments understand their aspect of the business. So if you give them that knowledge, the possibilities of what they could do with it are endless. And that's where, again, we really work to increase marketing's value within the organization because we're not just focused on the on the brand awareness and the advertising uh, component. We are now sharing insights that can be applied and impact operations across the organization. Absolutely. Well, I think that wraps it up for this week. So I want to thank everybody for making time for us this week and putting up with my raspy voice. <laughs> um, until next week, onward and upward. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast directory. If you want notes and links to resources discussed on the show, sign up to get them emailed to you each week at iterativemarketing.net. There, you'll also find the Iterative Marketing blog and our community LinkedIn group where you can share ideas and ask questions of your fellow Iterative Marketers. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our username is at I-T-E-R, the number 8, I-V-E, or email us at podcast at iterativemarketing.net. The Iterative Marketing Podcast is a production of Brilliant Metrics, a consultancy helping brands and agencies rid the world of marketing waste. Our producer is Heather Ullman with transcription assistance from Emily Bechtel. Our music is by Seastock Audio Music Production and Sound Design. You can check them out at seastockaudio.com. We'll see you next week. Until then, onward and upward. <laughs>